Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, by the way, I've got this QR code on every single slide, so if you want to look at any time, you can follow along uh, just as well. Thank you. All right, so first of all, um, why would you even want to build a uh, security logging stack? Well, this is because um, problems happen all the time, and um, for intrusion detection and um, I IDS and IPS, you really have to be able to capture those events to actually do something about them. So it's very important to do that. Um, your company might already have existing places um, to store logs, but it's good to have like one centralized location for everything. And also, it's always good to have a data sync for these type of events. A lot of times I see that same things happen, but because there's no great place to um, shove data, uh, these events get lost. So it's great to have just a generalized place for that. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, my name is George. I work at a company called Cloud Kitchens. Uh, we build, build a lot of ghost kitchens. We do uh, food delivery. Uh, my company runs in Kubernetes. Uh, we actually run across multiple clouds. Um, I used to work at AWS, but we currently run across you know, multiple different clouds. Um, I built one of the largest uh, Elasticsearch slash open search logging stacks, I think, in the world, perhaps. Um, and I actually built several, several more afterwards, um, and one sp specifically for uh, security. Oh, what happened to the... Did, did I step, step on a cable? Mm -hmm. Sorry, could, could you help us with AV? I don't know if I step on a cable or something. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Turn it off and back on again? Yeah. We don't have the budget for that as we, as we established. <laughs> I think it might be back. Wait, it's off. Wait for it. There we go. All right. Woo. All right. Be careful not to make any uh, sudden movements. All right. So my takeaway for you this, uh, hopefully, is that um, you get a sense of when to build versus buy. One's, not, one's actually not cheaper or than the other, uh, as it turns out. Um, if you do choose to build, I'd like to show you how to build it uh, very cost efficiently and also how to uh, pay for the stuff you need to make it very efficient in terms of um, uh, cost and uh, performance. And uh, once through about a year of optimizing for speed and cost, I'd like to distill that down and then pass that knowledge onto you. So here we go. All right, let's talk about the benefits of uh, build versus buy. So let's start with uh, buy. Obviously, if you buy something, it make, you make it someone else's problem. And that's actually very nice for being a manager and also engineer because you don't have to worry about it as much. That's a fantastic uh, point of view. Um, also gives you, uh, your team, a single point of contact when something goes wrong. That's uh, also very nice. Um, and sometimes you're already logged into a vendor. So for example, you have a big contract with an existing uh, provider. That actually can give you a very, very good discount on buying, buying stuff. So actually, that can be cheaper than anything you can build yourself. Um, I can talk about that later as well. Um, some downsides to buying is that, number one, you're vendor locked. So over time, you know, they'll release the price. It's hard for you to get out. So let's say all your data is stored in one uh, logging framework. Going to another one, it's hard to make the, move that data across. Um, sometimes uh, they actually will lie about their performance. So a lot of demos I saw from other companies is that they will give you a demo that works well for like a small size. But as you scale up over time, it actually doesn't scale at all. So that's actually a big thing to watch out for. Um, and sometimes also another thing we're seeing is that uh, support for them can be kind of slow as well. There's multiple support tiers for everything you buy, and uh, for the cheapest support tier, they don't get back to you within like a month or two or several weeks, and that could be a big problem. We have something that's going wrong. Um, oh, and also uh, key features are sometimes hide behind uh, paywalls, which is uh, a problem as well. Uh, but for build, um, you actually uh, you build with uh, known components, so you actually don't want to roll your own crypto to get the best bang for the buck. Uh, the biggest benefit of build is actually you, you own, own everything, both the software, the infrastructure, and the data. So one example is that if you work with government compliance, uh, you buy software from another country, in case of war or some kind of diplomatic fallout, uh, you may no longer have access to that software. That could be a big problem. Uh, if you build yourself, you can, you can always choose where you store that data, so you always can have a backup for it uh, should you need it. Oh, you can also choose to optimize between uh, cost and speed, which is a big thing. Uh, typically, when you buy from a vendor, they give you like these tiers that you put data into. Um, you can really have no choice over that, but if you choose to, to build, um, you can actually really make a lot of um, good choices about how you optimize for cost. Uh, oh, you also have a generation of, uh, you also have knowledge of how to operate this. So in case something does go wrong, you can fix it yourself, which is way better than having someone else manage your stuff. Um, obviously, there's some downsides to build as well. Uh, number one is the time and energy. So you have to be willing to do this. Um, you can build a stack I'm proposing in about two weeks comfortably if you got some knowledge of um, cloud. Um, cloud. Uh, one week's probably fine. Um, to tune it, you probably want another two weeks or so, so maybe a month just to um, generate for this. You have a bit of uh, liability as well, because after you build, you're responsible for patching your own data. 
uh, are you responsible for all the egress, ingress routes as well? It's kind of a headache, but um, it's probably worth the cost if you want to save money. Uh, and finally, it may be a little bit of uh, people's warehouse because uh, people like to do, um, you know, like penetration testing. They may not be familiar with building stuff. Uh, but a friend who's really good at hacking stuff together, I told him if you just hack more things together, eventually you come up with a full logging solution, which is what happened with our company. He did a really good job uh, doing this. Cool. All right, so let's talk about some of the benefits, uh, other, other benefits of uh, DIY. Uh, besides control over data security, um, you can really do that slider between the cost and the speed, which I'll show you. Um, Oh, also you can build your own plugins. So I'll be talking about using OpenSearch. So OpenSearch has a really rich uh, plugin framework. Um, almost all of it is not behind the paywalls. So if you want to build like a plugin for you know managing like Korean or like searching like Elvish, which, for example, if you need to, you can actually build that for yourself. Um, you also control your own security model and actually have a very rich security model. You can control who can access uh, what very easily. All right. So let's take a look at the, the cost. So here I'm using the public information. Um, obviously, with different discounts you have, different negotiations, it can vary greatly. I'm just using what's uh, out there. So if you start with Splunk, which is the biggest guy in the in the room, um, they charge about $150 per um, gigabyte of data ingest per per day. So it comes to about $60,000 per year. And oh, also the size of the cost I'm using here is pretty standard. It's uh, 40 gigabytes of ingestion per day. It comes to about uh, 0.4 megabytes of ingestions um, per second. So let's say you have like 100 um, applications, each generate about 10 kilobytes per second. That's kind of what it comes out to. Um, ends up with 7.2 terabytes of storage per month. So your cost will actually breaks down to both the compute port portion, which is memory and CPU, and also the cost, um, also the storage portion. So the longer you operate a uh, stack, the, um, the more the storage will um, come into effect. I'll show you how to optimize that as well. Um, if you go towards the next one, which is uh, Elasticsearch from the vendor, you actually get a cheaper um, package. But this is actually using the, the cheapest possible support package. Meaning if you message them, they'll get back to you with um, three to five business days. Uh, if you pay for the best support package, you are double, your, your cost actually almost doubles. So you have to make a decision there about you know, support versus um, what you get. Um, also, AWS sells a version of um, Elasticsearch as well called OpenSearch. They actually broke from uh, Elasticsearch a while back because of commercial licensing disagreements. Um, typically, it runs slightly slower than Elasticsearch, but that's something you actually know the difference if you run it yourself. Um, they have a service like that. If you, pay, if, you want, uh, if you get it, it's about half the cost of Splunk. Um, and if you just uh, run uh, OpenSearch yourself um, with the same exact specs without paying AWS for the management, uh, you get about 20% cheaper. And uh, finally, if you just build yourself super cheap, um, you can get down to even about half the cost of um, using AWS Manage yourself. So yeah, there you go. All right, before we dive into how to build a cluster, let's have a quick overlook at how the um, open search Elasticsearch works. So your data basically lives um, in things called indices, uh, essentially like a file of data. Um, as time goes on, your file gets larger and larger. You probably want to grow that file from one indice to another. So like week one is indices one, week two is indices two, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, each uh, file or indices also breaks into shards. So these are essentially components of the file. You don't have to do this, but uh, doing this has some benefits because number one, the shards can live on multiple um, computers for you know, resiliency. Uh, two is actually the shards can be um, searched uh, in parallel by multiple CPUs. So the more CPUs have, the, um, the better your search could be. But there's obviously like a trade-off between the number of uh, shards you have and also the speed. So you want to optimize for that as well. I'll talk about all this uh, towards the later slide for optimization. Cool. All right. Yeah. So this is the uh, simplest um, architecture for the logging stack. This will work for pretty much everybody and uh, actually use a lot of off-the-shelf components. So you start with the uh, application, which um, or whatever to generate log sources, and you have an application that takes that data and then shoves it into an open search. So there's a lot of off the shelf components. Um, I think log, uh, what's it called, log stash is actually a common one that people use. Um, An open search or Elasticsearch will, will do the job uh, just fine. Um, as you start building this, you actually want to think about uh, access already, uh, because each thing that pushes data into open search has different access to different indices. You want to already think about how you want to control um, what they can write to. So for, in our example, um, when we built this, basically different sources have different uh, log forwarders, and different log forwarders have access to different indices, and they can only write to them, not read to them. So even if they're compromised, you actually don't lose any data. Uh, from the perspective of the, uh, the user, they go through something called an uh, open search dashboard, or Kibana, if you're familiar with uh, the ELK stack. Uh, it's a simple UI that allows you to search the framework itself. Um, and then the simple login solution is username and password uh, set up for them, uh, which will work, work just fine. Uh, 
pro for this is that I think it should work fine for almost every setup. Uh, the setup I built in my company actually ingested about a thousand times the, um, the ingestion of this. I'll show you an uh, architecture that's more complex that can deal with a high level of skill. Uh, but I think for most people, this will work, work, work great. Um, some cons is that it's not as resilient to failures because um, you obviously have failures in both the, um, the log forwarder, the uh, open stash itself, or the um, application that shows data. Like if some problems, I'll show you how to deal with that. Um, and also you don't have probably the best way of managing logins because having user name passwords to, to do this is uh, kind of troublesome. All right, so here is the architecture I use for the stack that ingests about a thousand times the, uh, the rate of the previous one. Um, actually, this stack only costs about 10 times more than the, um, the stack for you, so you use about 200K to, to do this. Uh, the biggest changes are, are several. So let's start with um, uh, the log applications. So applications can live anywhere. They can live in multiple clouds, multiple um, regions, wherever you want. Uh, and they forward data forward uh, down, down the stream. And what you need to have is that you need to have a buffer. And uh, here we use Kafka. We can actually use almost anything. This is actually like a key um, importance because uh, with so many log sources and so much information being put, without a buffer like Kafka to buffer it, uh, failures will cause you to lose information. And this is actually a very important key to make it work. The second thing you need to have is have a second log forwarder after the buffer. Uh, this is to really just smooth out the, um, the data ingested because events don't happen like, you know, at an even rate. Sometimes you have a burst events, sometimes you have no events. Without a buffer to really like, make this even, you have to have problems pushing this stuff into um, open search itself. And when you push data into open search, you want to push it into uh, chunks. And a good chunk size, I, I, I like to recommend is five megabytes at a time for large size. You have to do up to like, I think like 30 megabytes, but um, I think you do get some, some diminishing return uh, over time. Uh, now if you look at the open search clusters, uh, there are multiple of them. So they, actually, they can be co-located with the data, meaning if you have data in AWS or Azure or GCP, you can have one open search cluster per region um, with the data. This makes it actually faster uh, in terms of you know, network level latency. It also like, um, saves a bit of money because you can be co-located for that. And the beauty about open search is that you can actually search across multiple clusters, multiple regions uh, simultaneously as long as have the right access uh, rules. And uh, for the user perspective, you got a user. You also have uh, SSO. So SSO is a simple integration that built into uh, open search. Uh, using SAML, you're able to um, use that uh, for your system. And the good thing about SSO is that a lot of people, companies already have people defining SSOs, and they're tied to different uh, groups. So for example, you, you, you'll know someone coming to your application. Are they an uh, engineer? Are they a product manager, et cetera? And from that, you can give them the appropriate access to the data they're trying to search. So engineers can only search something. Uh, other people can search other stuff. So with this result, you actually have a very resilient um, application. You can basically um, scale it to a very large degree. And um, also, you don't have any paywalls that uh, prevents you from uh, doing SSO because you're using open search. All right. Cool. Now let's talk about optimization. So I'll first talk about cost, and then I'll talk about performance. So for cost, um, you really want to understand how people use your application. And that's the thing with um, logging frameworks. Basically, events happen. You typically only, people typically only care about stuff that happened recently. Like uh, usually something happened is like, you know, within the last day or two, and that's, when you spend, and that's where you want to spend your money. So one thing you can do is that you can store the data that's most um, commonly accessed um, in a hot cluster, and everything else can push down to a lower cluster. So let's say you have like two, um, uh, computers. The first one is for hot data. It has the most CPU, the most RAM, the best SSDs, for example. And then anything past, you know, let's say, a week or so, you push to other computers that have less RAM, less CPU, and are more, uh, larger disks. So there's a little bit of trade-off for that, because if you search data that's older, obviously it can be slower, but um, you do save a lot of money doing that. Uh, the second, second thing to do is use uh, S3 bucket storage. So this actually is one of the biggest innovations I think have happened in terms of storage, because your cost is so expensive for storing a large amount of data. Let's say you store, like, um, multiple terabytes of data over time. That becomes tens of thousands of dollars pretty easily. But in S3, you actually become much, much cheaper. It's about uh, a 90, sorry, 90 percent reduction in cost in a lot of use cases. But you don't want to do that, you do not want to do that for um, frequently access data because you're charged per API access. So if you constantly access um, S3 data, you can actually end up paying more than you have to pay for this. Oh, the third thing to do is use spot nodes. So spot nodes is a concept with uh, Kubernetes, where basically people will pay for um, additional uh, resources, but uh, they actually can use it up. And then uh, when people are not using the resources they paid for, uh, the cloud providers will actually lease them out to other people to use uh, in the meantime. Uh, one downside to using spot nodes is that um, you can actually be kicked off the spot nodes at any time. 
Um, so you really have a resiliency built in, so you can really recover your cluster. If you kicked off a, a one of the nodes, so you can be spot, uh, scheduled on a different node. Uh, but the cost reduction is actually really high. Usually you get about 50% to 90% of uh, reduction in using costs. Um, oh yeah, uh, in terms of uh, optimization for performance, so one thing I recommend is you want to have exactly two replicas. So you have a primary, rep primary shard and a replica shard. So this means at any time, half your cluster can technically be down and you speed up and running. You do double the cost, but actually it's pretty useful. So co that combined with spot nodes means you're paying way less uh, infrastructure cost, but you also have a really high degree of resiliency. We were running spot nodes for like years and actually being mostly fine, but sometimes you do run into uh, trouble when spot nodes are just constantly being kicked off. So you actually do need, need permission like a real um, reserve node or on-demand node to really pay for that. But I think most of the time you're probably okay. Um, for shard sizes, you won't have um, as many shards as you have CPUs allocated because each CPU can search, uh, search a shard uh, in parallel and the shard sizes should be between 20 and 50 gigabytes. This is done through empirical testing and plus a lot of numbers that Elasticsearch publishes. But it does vary from computer to computer, so you can want to experiment that a little bit. But generally, that's a pretty good um, guideline. Uh, finally, if you do ingest the rate as we do, like you know, several hundred megabytes per second, you need to use SSDs. Uh, rec I re recommend magne magne magnetic storage from all, almost everybody um, because it's fast enough, um, because most things are cached in memory. But for SSDs, you really, you really need SSDs for um, like you know, hundreds of megabytes per second for ingestion. And one thing to know about SSDs, they actually vary across clouds. So for the same dollar uh, in Azure, you probably get more, um, more storage, but you do get less uh, I IOPS. So once you actually hardly uh, limited on is the IOPS for um for this uh, for your cloud provider. Another thing to note that we learned is that the IOPS is based on the size of the SSD you provision. So let's say you only need like a ten ter a ten let's say like one terabyte SSD, but you actually need a higher IOPS than that. So you actually need to provision a two terabyte SSD. So even though you waste some space, you need to have that IOPS to support your, uh, your operations. Well, another thing too is that if no one complains about your uh, search speed, you can actually reduce the CPU and memory over time. We did that gradually over a period of several months. We actually will save a lot of CPU and, and memory just by doing that, uh, because you know you don't need to spend that much money on the performance if no one complains about uh, your cluster being slow. So there you go. All right, uh, let's talk about security. Oh, and also maintenance. So maintenance actually is pretty easy. It's um, there's an idea of a ISM policy in OpenSearch, which basically allows the, the cluster to self-manage how you roll the data forward. So uh, once you said that, saying like, hey, the oldest data lives um, in this awesome really powerful uh, box, and after that it goes to a gradually like, slower boxes, and eventually get pushed out. Um, you can just do that. Once you set that, it pretty much is set and forget. Um, let's see, well, oh yeah, you want to use Git ops for configuration, because it's very easy for people to apply configuration and forget about them. So it's, I think it's just good practice to do that. Um, CIC is also very important for, for pushing out uh, in a timely manner. Uh, and finally, once you document the process, you can basically just relax and you know, drill it, and then you're pretty much fine. Uh, for security, it's actually kind of like an ongoing process. You need to constantly think about um, access of uh, different data. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways I had from previous jobs is that you want to have like a quarterly access review. So when I was at Amazon, every quarter people ask, ask hey, do you, do you still have access to this? And if you don't answer back, they basically remove your access, just so people don't have uh, access to things that you don't need. Uh, oh yeah, also you have to roll out patches yourself, which is kind of, um, it's not that hard, it's just something you have to keep on doing because you build your own cluster. All right, so uh, that's basically uh, my presentation. Um, hopefully, I give you a good idea of uh, when to build versus when to buy, and um, when you do build, um, how to like optimize for cost and uh, performance. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and uh, thank you very much uh, to B-Sides for letting me do this talk, my mentors and the people who are here to support me. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, my name is George. Thank you. All right. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I've got a bonus slide with a bunch of references for techn technical references um, for best practices if you guys care about. So, all right, thank you.